this is a white burgundy wine from Maison de Monti, which is a joint project between a woman named Alix de Monti and her brother Etienne. Their family has been making wine in Volnay since before the French Revolution. Cheers! Thanks for having me. Learning how to taste wine or learning about wine, you just stick your nose into the glass and the thing you always hear is, what do you smell and oh, what do you taste? And basically our noses are a lot more complex than our palates are anyway, so we're going to smell a lot more, but it's also the first time you smell something is the most pronounced and the way that our noses work and the way that we smell, the second time we smell that same thing, even if it's five or ten seconds later, we're going to miss a lot of those obvious smells because they're already in our senses. My husband, uh, Robert, has been very helpful in terms of really early exposure to great wines. I feel lucky that I've had a good handful. I would say um, in restaurants, Danielle Ballou, absolutely. So that was my first serious restaurant job. I was invited to cook uh, with him at this event called the La Palais de Neige in Aspen in 2006. And it was a really small group of chefs and a small group of winemakers from Burgundy. And that was the moment for me where I knew that I wanted to work with wine. Bonnie Munchen from Nick and Tony's gave me my first million job, and she has been a mentor in so many ways, in the restaurant world and, and in life in a lot of ways. I feel like this is a cool industry because sort of everyone that you work with in some capacity becomes a mentor for, for different things. What's funny you ask? I uh, have been asked to be part of a show called Vine Talk, which is more of a talk show. I can see something with wine going towards that reality direction. And that's been a complete surprise and a really fun project. Um, we were actually here at Lotus of Siam. I was um, working here. Rachel came in twice. Uh, she came in with a group the first time and I opened a bottle that, that they liked. And she came in again with her husband, John. She's hilarious. She is a riot. She has the best sense of humor. And they just sat down and they said, we're in your hands. And that's when she and John told me about this project they're doing with eHow. Rachel uh, has partnered with them and she is basically bringing them a lot of a lot of great content. So Rachel has a, a pastry chef buddy and a cocktail buddy, and I get to be the wine buddy, and, and it's fun because I get to talk about wine and do some, some filming. It's wonderful. I actually, I've been able to do that every year since 2006. It's a very special place for Indy. You have these monks who have been making wine in these vineyards, or who started making wine in these vineyards centuries ago. To be there uh, every year, I think, is, is very helpful from a sommelier perspective. You actually be part of the land and see the grapes and hear the conversation. Wine critics have an opinion, and that's great, but we all have opinions, and so I think this is an interesting statistic that I learned recently. Um, so wine critics are very influential for male buyers, whereas women are more influenced by what the wine tastes like, and what the label looks like, and price point. So you have all. Uh, I, th I think that a critic, I think a critic is useful in certain ways. I think at the end of the day, uh, it's one person's opinion, and if your palate is uh, resonates with that person's opinion, then then great. But but the danger of these critics is that you have them training people how to taste whether or not they actually like that style of wine. Yeah, I would love to. You have men and women who buy wine very very differently, and I didn't want to make a wine for women because I won't. Think, but I wanted to make a wine that appealed to different sensibilities than the ones that are currently marketed. Um, okay, so these are just fresh from yesterday. So uh, the concept here is that uh, we learn visually. And rather than read a bunch of, uh, read a paragraph about all the flavors that are in the wine, this, these, are, these are the major ones. And cherry, tart cherry being the most prominent, pomegranate, 
right after that, um, some fresh herbs and some dried herbs, a little tiny bit of uh, cinnamon and vanilla. The idea is to empower people and to give them the tools to learn their own palate so that they know what they like. And that if they do like a really full-bodied, very oak-driven wine with a lot of tannin and a lot of alcohol, that they can that they can learn that and that they can ask for those things when they go into a restaurant or a retail. So it's meant to be um, empowering. And then this little logo here is actually the Tory Birch Foundation logo. So Tori um, has become a friend and her foundation was extremely inspiring. It empowers female entrepreneurs through microfinance domestically. Having a company that can give back or serve a purpose is, um, is inspiring. Bellis. Um, it was, I think, conversations with a lot of a lot of friends who said we don't know how to choose a wine when we go into a restaurant. We don't know what language we're supposed to use. We don't know, and, and this intimidation. And the thing is, wine is wine does not have to be intimidating. Wine wine is grapes, and wine has been around for so many centuries. And wine is is really a fundamental beverage in terms of our our culture and and. There's all this sort of pretense around it, and it doesn't have to be. So the inspiration was just having these conversations and realizing that, hey, there seems to be a void. Why is nobody? Why is nobody trying to actually use the label, which is your biggest talking point as a way of educating the consumer and empowering them to have tools to learn what they actually like. Our shoes as we danced to a tune in a slow for four time. The first meal that comes to mind as as one of the most important for a variety of reasons was, uh, was my first dinner at Twelve Row, and it was the night that Robert and I got engaged. And it is one of the most remarkable, it is the most remarkable restaurant I've, I've ever been in. It is so worldly. The, the influences are so global. There's a lot of Japanese influence, there's a lot of French influence. Everything about that meal was remarkable. I love Robotaya. Actually, in New York on 9th Street, this is a Japanese restaurant. You go in, and it's it's super neighborhood. Um, it's a bunch of Japanese people, and then a couple of, of non-Japanese people who figured it out. But it's um it's fresh eggplant. It's fresh, all these amazing fresh ingredients, fresh fish, fresh poultry, vegetables, and it's just grilled beautifully on this big grill. It's, it's between you and and the guy behind with the big pizza thing, and it's it's fun. It's delicious. It's fresh. It's, Creative. I think 11 Madison I would have to say that, that what they're doing is, is, I think, extremely innovative for, especially for New York, but they, they decided that they wanted to be relevant on the global stage and then they just made all these gradual changes that are, that are leading up to that. I think there are two things. One, I hope to be useful. I think that we're here on Earth and we're given an opportunity to, to be here for a number of years and, and to, to contribute in a, a, a useful way. I actually wrestled with that for a while. Is, what, is wine really important and is, is this really a meaningful existence? To be able to uh, help people relax and enjoy their life more, I think that that's, a, that's noble. Um, I think also with, in particular with Bellas to um, empower women to trust what they like and to learn what they like and to um, to be empowered to, to know that. I want to say to you there's no guarantee when you play, wait and see, so get off the bench and get into the game before it's too late Before they close the gate Before you're left with yourself